Hello and welcome to this video from my political ideas series and today we are looking at nationalism and we're going to look at all the different types of nationalism well no maybe not all of them but we're going to look at a, the key selection we're going to look at liberal nationalism conservative nationalism anti and post-colonial nationalism uh, black nationalism uh, chauvinistic nationalism and expansionistic nationalism those last two kind of feed into each other so lots to get on get on with so let's crack on. right so there are a number of tensions and arguments about all this stuff that you're looking at and the, the, there's some bits that i'm going to keep highlighting and i want you to kind of reflect on as we go through there's a lovely quote here from anthony smith who describes nationalism as a chameleon ideology and that it adapts to fit with ideologies from across the political spectrum so this is one of the odd bits one of the, the really interesting bits of nationalism is that you will find nationalists on the left you will find nationalists on the right you will find liberal nationalists you will find authoritarian nationalists so it's quite difficult to pin down so we need to look at these various debates that surround nationalism uh, and consider consider them when thinking about the different types and th these are the kind of things that might then feed into the essays and things that you are asked if you're, you're asked about the different types so are there different types of nationalism are they progressive isn't they looking to create a better a better nation a better society or are they regressive and reactionary that they're looking to the past they're looking to go backwards um, they've kind of got an idea of how the world used to be and they want to go back towards that or they're reacting against um, something that's happening for example French Revolution or, uh, or or other things like that are they inclusive or exclusive so they, if they're inclusive then essentially you can join anybody can join are they exclusive it says well actually our nation is only about this group this race this this people who speak this language people who have these traditions and cultures so again some some forms of nationalism are inclusive some are exclusive are they rational or irrational so are they based on kind of logic and reason or is they based on emotion and, and kind of a a, 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 a response of, of of some kind of irrational thought and are they civic or or are they cultural ethnic or or, or racial or, or religious so so if they're civic then it, it's based on the institutions and, and the the structures of the government structures and things like that or is it is it something again cultural or ethnic or language or race and again so the the civic ones will tend to be more rational the 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 ones based on on culture or ethnicity are going to be more irrational so these are all important things to be thinking about as we go through right so we'll start with liberal nationalism so <laughs> with this one it, it, they say just like liberals would say about individuals nations should be able to determine their own path they should have kind of self-determination uh, and they are therefore progressive um, they, they oppose hereditary rule uh, they promote self-determination it links to uh, the ideas of uh, Manzini who's one of our key thinkers uh, it's inclusive because anyone committed and loyal to a nation's value can become part of that um, that nation it's not based on your culture or your religion or your race or your ethnicity or your language so you can be part of that nation uh, no matter what that kind of other background is is as long as you are committed um, to the values of that nation and you are loyal to it so it's based on the ideas of civic nationalism which uh, goes back to another one of our key key thinkers Rousseau and again so this this is a really kind of important element of this that you can link in and bring together different key thinkers when you're writing about it because remember you have to use examples from your key thinkers in your essays a really good example of, of liberal nationalism is the USA so this idea of a, a kind of a multi-ethnic multi uh, a multicultural society where people come in but they're still patriotically American they might have other things about identity and, and national origin but uh, or racial origin or religious origin but they, they are all American and they're brought together by the Constitution and the um, liberal values and things like that that there's not not all nationalism in America actually is liberal nationalism but liberal nationalism is a uh, a really important aspect of it uh, and again we we see rationality in so supports rationalism uh, is, is 
and again, another demonstration of this would be uh, the EU, where we've got this setting with the, these kind of independent economies, which has then led to greater harmony. And it's, liberal nationals seek this this world of, of independent nation states, but that they they should work together, that they should that there should be harmony and cooperation between them. So liberal nationalism supported the freeing of states from colonialism uh, and the creation of democracy. So again, it, it, it relates very strongly to democracy. Uh, and it talks about, again, like liberal, you'd expect from liberals, it talks about equality between the states. But just like it's built into liberalism, like modern liberalism in terms of the, uh, the ideology, they, they accept that th there is going to be inequality in, in the world. And therefore, they, they look at mechanisms of supporting the weaker nations to stop them being oppressed by the stronger ones and to give them that equality of opportunity, if you like, if we look, go back to our, our liberal ideology. And to do this, they're kind of... Uh, Whilst a liberal in a nation would have a state to, and then that state would protect the rights of individuals, in in the, the firm of nationalism, they talk about the need for for supranational uh, institutions such as the League of Nations or the United Nations or the EU to to kind of support and protect um, the rights of the smaller nations that might might have those rights taken away from them by the more powerful ones. So the UN is somewhere where smaller states can go to and say, look, we are being oppressed. We are being attacked or bullied by this bigger nation. We can't do anything to defend ourselves. But will the international community come in on our side? And that is a really important part of liberal nationalism. It tends to be quite strong amongst nationalists in countries that are part of a, a long, a larger political unit. So, for example, liberal nationalism is, is the kind of nationalism you would see strongly in Scotland, for example. Right. Another form of nationalism is conservative nationalism. And this is really quite different. So it, it's first of all, it's not worrying about international instances. It is worried about the, the nation itself. Uh, um, and, and it's not necessarily kind of a nation state for everybody, they're, but they're saying, well, we should have a nation state. And it focuses more on um, tradition, so so history, culture, language, and the, how they bound, bind a nation together. So it's not kind of an idea of a civic uh, nationalism. This is, is a, a cultural nationalism, so it's different to, to liberal nationalism in that way. It links to, to Herder's ideas of this Volkgeist, so this idea of this, this kind of spiritual connection um, to the nation. And it tends to be nostalgic and look backwards uh, and focusing on traditions, making it kind of regressive and reactionary rather than progressive. So again, this is a way that it is different to liberal nationalism. It, it is based on emotion, not reason. So it's, it's not it, it tends to be irrational um, and the ways of thinking. Think about the kind of some aspects of British nationalism. So, for example, love of our queen, all the pomp and ceremony around state occasions, things like royal weddings, um, people who have had nothing to do with historical events in Britain's past, getting very passionate about them um, and it, it, lots of flag waving and things like that. And that's. Not necessarily saying it's, it's, saying it, it, it's always bad, but what it's saying is it, it's not it's not rational. You you're not you're not celebrating things that you have a a, a, a kind of a rational stake in something that you have taken part in or done something towards. You have this emotional attachment or connection to your nation. There has been some really strongly negative sides of, of conservative nationalism. It, it, it did lead to um, it, ideas such as imperialism and uh, colonization because this emotional attachment to the nation has a tendency uh, to, to a lead to the idea of the greatness of that nation and, uh, and leading in towards ideas of superiority. So in this, so we've seen, we saw when we did conservatism, we looked at one nation conservatism, ideas of Disraeli and, and also in Germany of, of Bismarck. And this kind of links in with the imperialist idea, because one of the things that you're doing is in uniting your own nation, you're giving them things to unite around and foreign conquest uh, was one of those. It tends to be exclusive uh, in the being part of the nation is, is very much about shared history and experience and language and culture. And therefore, people who don't have those things tend to be excluded um, from it. And actually, so therefore becoming or feeling as part of that nation, if you don't, if you're not born into it, is something that can be um, a slightly harder thing to achieve than it would be under liberal nationalism with civic nationalism, where you can 
pledge your allegiance to to the constitution and the flag and you you, you are american um whilst for example in, in this the, there's been a lot of stuff in talks in britain about the, it being being british being a bit more than that being a bit more complicated there's a really infamous example of this um from a, a member of um thatcher's cabinet a guy called norbin tebbett and he talks about the cricket test uh, and and this led to um, real kind of strong accusations of racism. Um, and, and what he suggested that, that for example, British Asians that, that when watching the cricket went and supported India or Pakistan and not England, he, he made the statement that in his mind, therefore, they, they weren't fully British because they weren't on board with the nation. They were still attached to a different nation. And again, I, this is something that lots of people really um, strongly disagreed with, and it's not necessarily part of nationalism full stop, because you, you, you could have people who were looking at, at citizenship in places like Britain from a kind of civic nationalism, liberal nationalism point of view. But from a, a traditional conservative nationalism, the ideas pushed by Tebbit, then that would make it more exclusive than inclusive. And, and this would link with one of our key thinkers, uh, Morass, and he promoted the form of kind of conservative nationalism, which and we'll see this again with chauvinistic nationalism later on, which has racial uh, elements. And, and Mor uh, Morass was, uh, was uh, racist, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, uh, and, and but he had this guy regressive idea of, of returning France to its previous position of glory going back before revolutions. Right. <clears throat> now, conservative nationalism is, is probably one of the, the, the things that we most associate with nationalism, with those kind of ideas and those those kind of emotional attachments to nations uh, and uh, and some of the, the, the lot more really unpleasant side of stuff as well with the, the bit that came out. With, with links with empire and, and racism and and, exclusi uh, uh, and exclusivity. Now, a form of nationalism, which is a really interesting form of nationalism, which is maybe not one we, na we naturally think about when we, we first think of nationalism, is, is anti-colonial and post-colonial nationalism. Now, anti-colonial nationalism is, is when indigenous groups, so that the, the, the people of a particular place, begin to question and reject the authority of, of colonial powers who have taken control of, of their land. Uh, and they, they start pushing their own sense of nationhood uh, as a national group or, or nation that is being held under control oppressively by another. Uh, one of the most famous an anti-colonial leaders was Mahatma Gandhi in India, who used non-violent uh, methods to tackle British uh, control of India and force the British uh, to end their, uh, their control of India ultimately. Post-colonial nationalism is then the next stage, really, and, and this looks at the experiences of nations once they've gained independence uh, and, and then the, the states that they form and the nations that they create. Um, now, a good example of where this has happened is if we look at, at, at Africa, for example, um, this has divided up in the 19th century, mainly in the, um, the 1880s with a conference in Berlin. Uh, and, and the European powers kind of falsely drew boundaries and borders in, in various bits of Africa and kind of want you have that bit, we'll have that bit. By 1914, 90% of Africa was under various colonial control. And you'll see this with African nations even today, where some of them will have um, English as a language, some of them will have French, some will have um, Portuguese uh, 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 or Dutch and things like that. So where other bits of bits of, of Europe have kind of carved up Africa in the 19th century and has still left a, a legacy even today. In the 20th century, African nations gained their, their independence and formed their own states and identities. And then that's moving us into the post-colonial period. Now, post-colonial nationalism is is quite difficult to pin down because a bit like I said at the beginning with nationalism, where it takes lots of different forms. Uh, one of the most common ones actually with uh, post-colonial nationalism is, is, is forms of Marxist or socialist government. Not all post-colonial uh, nationalist governments follow this, but it, it's been seen in quite a few. So, um, for example, we've seen this with Fidel Castro in Cuba. Uh, in uh, Tanzania under Julius uh, Nyeria, uh, Leopold uh, Seneg Senegal in Senegal, uh, Kwame uh, Nkrumah uh, of Ghana. Uh, and post-colonial uh, nationalism and, and why it might um, adopt 
uh, the ideas of, of Marx. Can, partly might be to, to do with the economic circumstances and, and um, difficulties that these nations follow, but it, it can be a bit more of that than that. It can be about rejecting uh, the old colonial powers and the systems that they used, so it's going for something that is completely different to what was imposed on you by the previous colonial power. It can be about creating independent economic systems which aren't reliant on old colonial powers. It can be trying to, to form a, a, a sense of um, unite something that unites the nation. It's so kind of like political ideas and things that the, the nation can get behind, and often a, an individual. And we, we see lots of dominance of, of um, single rulers uh, or single parties in these nations, um, where they're looking for something that unifies the nation and therefore trying to to mitigate against kind of old tribal or, or ethnic um, loyalties that might exist within that territory. And a part of it can be about re rejuvenating a nation. And a, a good example of this is, is in Tanzania, uh, where there was this huge push on providing free education and medical facilities. And these resulted in some really, really positive things in terms of high literacy rates, um, halving of infant mortality. Ultimately, the economic system itself collapsed, but the the, 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 the idea of rejuvenation really took um, a, a positive step forward. So in looking at all of this, again, we've got some of these ideas that we've been talking about. It's quite difficult to absolutely pin down. So some of it is progressive. It's about wanting to improve societies in these nations from, from what ha they had been before and the situation people have been in before. But also we can see in, in some ways it's been reactionary. It's about rejecting the colonial systems that have been imposed on people. They tend to um, tend to be kind of civic nations because they're, they're made up of multitudes of tribes or different groups and different languages and different cultures all inside one nation. I've spoken in a previous video about the Rainbow Nation, which is South Africa, and that would again be an example of a need for a, a civic nation because um, you, you've not got a single shared history, tradition, culture, language uh, within the nation. So there is a mixture of inclusive and exclusive nations. So for, if, for exam, example, if we look at uh, post-colonial uh, India, where we get the, the, um, the divide, where we creation of India and then Pakistan and Bangladesh, um, and they, these are divided on religious grounds. And so and they are therefore excluding people on religious grounds. If we look at uh, Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe, then again, there, there was this idea of, in, of excluding certain groups, for example, um, uh, the African white settlers. Um, whilst in, in Tanzania, we look at uh, this idea of uh, Unjama, uh, and this is the idea of family and community. And this is the idea was, was to bind a well, potentially divided nation together. So this was about uh, uh, inclusivity. Uh, uh, and different, therefore. So we get variation. Another uh, kind of important um, form of nationalism, and this is linked very much to kind of anti and post colonial nationalism, is black nationalism. Uh, and this is developed by one of our key thinkers, Marcus Garvey, and it focuses on the common ancestry of all black people, linking it back to Africa. So Garvey looked to create this new type of nation, one that was, about, was borderless um, and uh, was created on the basis of a shared consciousness. So again, uh, we're, we're looking at, at something which is more of emotional rather than necessarily a rational uh, idea. He wanted the black people around the world to return to Africa and create this, this state and then the state to be a huge success. And, and about this was about proving equality. Um, he also talks a lot about black pride and the idea that black people should be proud of their race and see beauty in themselves and not try and chase white ideals of beauty. So, for example, um, not trying to use adopt white hairstyles. And we see a lot of this uh, in black nationalism and the elements of the civil rights movement in the, uh, the 1960s and into the 1970s with the black power movement. So a lot of this starts under, it can then is continued under Malcolm X and then continues into groups like the Black Panthers and others afterwards. Right. Now, the really grim side of um, nationalism is, is chauvinistic nationalism, which, which tends to, to lead to um, expansionist nationalism. And, and, and this is the, the stuff that really, I must say, when I decided I was going to do nationalism as a topic, this is the bit that I think needs talking about. Is, but it is the, the really unpleasant side of nationalism. Uh, and, and this is the bit which a lot of people, I think, 
only immediately think of when they think of nationalism. So chauvinic, chauvinistic nationalism is based on the idea that, that one nation is superior to other nations, therefore the other nations are, are inferior. It is irrational uh, because it's not based on any, any kind of rational grounds. It's just generally speaking, if you, you, you have a group of chauvinistic nationalists around, they will all believe that their own country is superior and the, and the nations of the others are inferior. It, it's not based on anything concrete. It is just an irrational belief. Um, they are all, always e exclusive. There's always a chosen group which they decide are the good and then uh, everybody else who they decide that aren't. And it, they tend to uh, persecute uh, groups that they believe to be inferior. So it tends to be explicitly racist um, it, and it sees out national identity on racial grounds. And uh, one of the, the strongest historical examples of this is Nazi Germany. Uh, this it, it, exaggerated patriotism it is associated uh, uh, with Morass, one of our key thinkers. It tends to lead to militarism, often citing military glory in the past and promoting conquest and military heroism. And again, we've seen examples of this in the 20th century. So Nazism in Germany, Japanese nationalism in the 1930s to 1940s and Italian fascism. It is associated with fascism, imperialism and nativism, again, uh, which is focused within countries saying that there is a particular group that needs is special and needs looking after uh, and treating better than any of the others. So this is the really unpleasant side of nationalism. And it links to the other really unpleasant part of nationalism, which is expansionist nationalism. Uh, and this we see, for example, again in Nazi Germany, when Hitler famously talk, talks about uh, Lebensraum or living space in the East. Uh, and what expansionist and chauvinistic nationalism led them to the belief was that, that they had a greater claim on the land than the people who were living there, the Slavic races that were, that were living there, because the Nazis considered that group to be inferior to them. And therefore, they thought it was their right to go and just take their people's resources off them and move them out of the way or kill them. Uh, which was the case of the Nazis. Um, the idea is, is highly regressive. It, it's looking to um, to uh, an idealised past. So the kind of Hitler talks about the warrior spirit of the the Aryan race going back to the Teutonic Knights. Um, Mussolini talked about the the greatness of Rome going back to the Roman Empire. So it's not something looking forward. It's something looking back, and and it tends to try and prevent growth and change. Uh, it, it's based on a form of in, integral nationalism, which again is an idea of, uh, of uh, morass, uh, and is highly, highly I irrational. Right, so I hope that's really helped. I've gone through a whole range of different forms of nationalism. And as you can see, if you go all the way from liberal nationalism on one extreme to uh, chauvinistic, expansionistic uh, nationalism on the other, they are very, very different beasts. Uh, and whilst some embrace kind of democracy and liberty and freedom, others are the basis of some of the most horrendous uh, atrocities uh, the world has ever seen. So we have got a real mix. We've got a mix of all those different bits I spoke about at the beginning in terms of rational, irrational, inclusive, exclusive, uh, democratic, undemocratic. And these are the kind of things that you need to, to be thinking about so you can compare different types of nationalism and come up with some arguments. I've also highlighted um, connections to different key thinkers. Um, and again, it's really important that you also look at the key thinkers videos to build your ideas on that because they're the guys you're going to have to have the evidence from in your essays. Right. So a bit longer than I would normally like. So please uh, like, leave me any comments. And please, if you haven't done so already, support the channel. Can you make sure you subscribe, turn on the notifications. So when I produce more and more really helpful videos for A-level politics that you are the first to know. Right. Thank you very much for watching, everybody.